up, everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean, and I got a very special guest, as you guys can't really see, but you can see. You see there's a little box over there. Uh, this guy is, like, he's just one of the dopest artists, not artists, uh, technically, uh, he, but he carries his writing out like an art. He's one of the dopest writers, um, journalists out there in the game right now. Um, his name is Yo, Yo Phillips. Now, if you don't know him, he's a senior writer for DJ Booth, and you're just going to have to do your research, man, and read some of them articles. Um, he's definitely somebody worth keeping up with, but you're going to learn a little bit more about him in this interview. So let's go ahead and hop right into this thing and introduce, yo, what's good, man? Man, you too kind. That was a wonderful intro. I'm going to have to take you around with me. <laughs> that was easy, you know? <laughs> that was just too kind, man. I, I try. I do my best to to make sure the writing is uh, of a quality to be considered an artist. So I appreciate that. But hey. you know, I, I I just do my best, brother. For, hey, for sure, man. It was um, it was super easy because I'm I'm a fan, man. I didn't even prep for that, so I was listening to myself <laughs> as I talked. <laughs> well, very well done. Very well done. Hey, so like when when I um. Just to make people clear, before we even get deeper into the interview, right? Like, D, if you don't know DJ Booth, like, you, if you know XXL, you, Mag, you know, I don't know, a lot of these other random publications, Complex, if you really, especially if you consider yourself an artist and manager, you really need to know DJ Booth. Um, like, you, you gotta, you gotta, you know, spank yourself some a little bit because DJ Booth <laughs> is a far more serious publication. Nothing wrong with all the other publications but the way the writing is it's more long form it's true content when i say talk about getting yourself in a blog i'm talking about people carrying them things out like dj blue uh some of the noisy articles not just a random blog post they put your 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 uh your song up there write two lines and it's over that doesn't help fans right there needs to be a real opinion about you good or bad and that's dj booth he's a senior writer for DJ Boot. So, um, and he was one of the few people media um, invited to the Dreamville session, if you don't know about that. We'll get into that at some point as well. So, um, now, again, th through hyping you up, but really needing these people to understand <laughs> before, they, before they click off the interview because they're like, who is this guy? Um, he's definitely worth listening to. So, yo, man, how did you even get into writing in the first place like what made you do this seriously because we're in that age where you know blogging is considered dead by a lot of people for a lot of reasons you know it's funny living in atlanta well i live right outside of atlanta i was born and raised in the city and kind of been living outside of it for most of my life right. but i graduated high school in 2009 and if you were coming out of high school or even coming out of college at the time, you knew we were hitting, we got hit with the recession. That sure. was like the big thing. And well, because of the recession. Do. Say that again? What well, high school did you go to? Mara High School. Ah, bet. Okay. Yeah. So if you if you were around that time, if you were coming out of school at that time, you knew that the job market was trash. It was probably one of the hardest times, especially if you didn't have any experience to get a job. And that's what I was trying to do when I got out of high school. I was just trying to go right to work. I was just trying to make some money. And because that was just something that couldn't happen, like I could not get a job. I was going on all these interviews. I was doing as much as I could to get work, and I couldn't. With that free time, all I did was listen to music and read books. That was it. I was pretty much just like on that pit. I was on Two Dope Boys. I was on All Right. I was on DJ Booth. I was on all the sites that were really like, Introducing the artists like J. Cole, Wale, Charles Hamilton, Asher Roth. Like, that's how I really got my foot in. Like, yeah. the, that generation of artists was just because I had time to study and listen to music. And that eventually turned into wanting to share opinions about music. So, I had a few opportunities to write for some small blogs, some smaller sites, and did that for a couple of years and was just passionate about words, was passionate about music and wanting to be able to share like what I thought was, was good, good opinions and what I wanted to, if, if I had something I wanted to debate, if I had something I wanted to, to engage with people about the best way to get that out was to write it, you know, to share it that way. I was interviewing a bunch of artists 
And all of that culminated to me getting the opportunity to write for a DJ Booth's brother site, Refine Hype, that was ran by Nathan Slavic. And, you know, Nathan really liked my work. Nathan was the first person to really acknowledge me as far as like a writer who who did that for his, his life was writing. You know, I didn't meet anyone before him. That's all they did. I knew people that blogged. But they also had like day jobs and night jobs. But he was the only one I knew who just had a site and was working it. So writing for him, having an editor to work with, that really helped kind of fine tune my writing a bit. And then it went to uh, DJ Z. Z was one of the founders of DJ Booth when Refine Hype and DJ Booth decided to merge. Okay. Then my work crossed over and he was a fan, you know. That was the thing because Refine Hype was long form and DJ Booth was mostly like music premieres and music videos. But they saw, they recognized that long form essays and articles had value. And when they saw that value through Refine Hype, it was like, well, let's just become one. They merged and then that really kind of jump started me writing for DJ Booth. Uh, and starting to get an audience that I was able to quit my job at Olive Garden and come work at DJ Booth full time since 2015. Bet. Three years in. Congratulations, bro. Man, thank you, bro. Thank you, man. It's, it's more like four, four going on five, because I did some freelance stuff very early on. Like, I was working with DJ Booth, but it wasn't full time. Like, I didn't get a chance to, like, quit my job until, like, the end of that 2014 year. So... But yeah, 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 like they've been rocking with me for a long time and I really appreciate them just giving me the opportunity and letting me grow. Oh yeah, not just, I mean, but not just that, I'm just talking about congratulations for the, you know, you out the job and you working on, how, on what you doing. <laughs> yeah, man. Honestly, it was something, I, I had figured it wasn't going to happen for me until 2028, 20, my birthday this year. I didn't think I was going to be able to quit my job and get, I thought I was going to have to work a job until I was 28 before I would do anything full-time writing. So getting to do that early yeah. really was like, it blew my mind. Like, I, it was so many times I couldn't believe it happened this way. You know, that I was waking up every day and just focusing on writing. You know, that was something I didn't envision for myself until I was, like, knocking on 30. So to do that before, it was, uh, it was a lot for me, man. It was a lot to process for a while. It's dope because basically you live in the dream that a lot of artists are looking at, like that, you know, just doing what you want to do for a living. Yeah, yeah, I don't take it for granted. Uh, most days I don't take it for granted, that's for sure. <laughs> so yeah. Some days are rougher than others, man, I'm telling you. Hey, man, like, I think that's funny, like, when you mentioned just the opinions and wanting to give opinions, because although we are in an era where it seems like opinions are just, you know, they're, they're everywhere, right? It's right. still just the thing that creates the value at the end of the day. Like you almost just can't report like these, like these days, because it's not going to differentiate you. They, there were some, I, I don't know if you used to see like the news, well, they probably still do them on complex, right? They'll, they'll like hear the news and yeah, they got, they get a lot of views because it's complex and they have a lot of views, but my right. opinion is it could be far more stronger. I've always felt this way. It could be more, far more stronger and get more views if they gave opinion, but they're just sharing it. You know, they take, they strip the personality out of the people when they give news, all that stuff. And then it kind of started to show itself when Everyday Struggle came out and things like that. But I always felt like, like, like it's, there's, no, there's nothing, no reason for me to come back to this outside well, of this. Especially once we start receiving news on like a social media speed, which is everyone sees everything together. Like mm -hmm. all at one time, there's nothing to report. And we're, all, we're already engaging with opinions. So what you want to do is be the platform to have that first opinion. You know, that's why I like the one that's review, the DJ Booth um, album review style is so prevalent for the site is because we understand we're getting albums all together. So mm -hmm. if you as a listener is engaging with the album this way, then we should be able to try and give you that same experience but from a critical standpoint so to still take that hot take esque format but add that critical ear to it and i think that makes the world a difference because we don't live in a time where um publications are getting albums a month in advance two weeks in advance three weeks in advance you're literally getting it with the public so and i mean kudos to all of my, my my writers who do get an album three days can have like the most concise uh, critical analysis because it makes us think faster. 
It's mm-hmm. just we try to find a format where we're thinking as fast as the audience is and yeah. not a dick later, you know. But that's it. Like, literally, that is what we live in right now. It has to be hot. It has to be fast. It has to be opinionated because we all are engaging with content that way. Yeah, man. I mean, I get it. I was thinking about the one listen review because, you know, I understand it from even SEO pro purposes and things like that. But and I and I get it from a marketing and branding purposes too just from a concept is is dope right we right. one view and this, this is what we think after only listening one time being specific versus right. you know we listen to it this is our thing this is it tells you more and gives you more context about it but it also what i, what I love about it it also um it maintains you guys journalistic integrity by right. seeing that as one listen as opposed to acting like it's this real critical thing yeah. You know I mean? Back in the day, when we first started, we wanted to do like follow up reviews. But the thing is, they weren't as, I don't think the public was so interested in them because it was like, well, if you're going to take two weeks to do a follow up, we're already past that though. You know, we've already heard it. We've decided how we felt about it. We've moved on. So now you're playing backwards. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Now we're trying to bring something back that's two weeks old. But like, if it's two weeks old, how old is that on the internet? It's like two months old at this point. Like, unless it's something incredible, and if it's incredible, you already know that. You know, you don't need to reanalyze something amazing. But it's something that you might feel lukewarm about and you want to engage with again, the audience might not feel the same way. So that's why we find other ways to talk about albums. That's why we do, you know what I'm saying, our editorial pieces. If you see an album consistently being written about, that means our writers are engaging with that album consistently. That mm. means it, it was something more than, oh, that's good. Oh, oh that's okay. Oh, oh, okay, I see what you were doing. Maybe this will grow on me. And some of the growers do end up having some very interesting pieces, but I knew last year when Saba album drop, having so many writers write about Saba, that tells you, oh, this album's incredible. This is doing mm. something. Some people are writing about Cardi B. Something about that album is striking. Like it's it's deeper than just views. It's like there's something about this music here that is encouraging mm. people to want to have thoughts, to 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 listen to it, to engage with it on a consistent basis and pull things out of it. I feel like I love that aspect of it now too. I mean, I love an album review. I really love seeing somebody break down an album. But I love what comes after that. It's not necessarily in a review format, but in a more thoughtful, a less analytical way. You know, you're really, you think, you're thinking about this in a personal way. You're thinking about this in, in comparison to your life, in comparison to your friend's lives. You're looking at this thing as uh, an experience now and not just something to review. Yo, I never thought about it that way. That's actually super dope because the first thing I think when you say that is it's like, this inward culture you guys kind of have where like we're peering into your culture you guys write y'all continue conversations and we get to hear you or your different conversations and opinions that's right this solidify oh this this is the the manifesto on this album like you want to keep talking about it in the same way i might keep talking about it with the homies or something in some way and we basically get to see you keep talking about it in different ways so that's kind of isn't cool. that isn't that so true when you love an album and you take it to your homies you recommend it and then y'all engage with it afterwards yeah like to me, that's just what we do as writers are we're able to inspire each other to to take their thoughts on something and broaden it out to open that thing up and i mean writers it is a community of us it's not a it's not a big community but we all are we all have the same job we are engaging with music full time or part time in some capacity so if that's your job and that's your life and the other people around you are doing that too like naturally the things you love you're going to have those conversations and they're going to inspire you to do further writing that's beyond just you know uh, a quick review you know like it's, it's always bigger than the review i love album reviews but to me what really solidifies an album to me and like, and like the talk about class we talk about time with you like tell me how many people wrote about this after the release date tell me how many people took that album that was released in january and wrote about it until december and then continued to write about it that's what i love about 444 like how many people continue to do pieces about that album long yeah. after the release date that was just one of those albums where it was so much to dissect. It was so much to peer into. 
And, you know, when you have that opportunity to have an album that makes you think so much and make you consider things and make you at least consider how you view this person before, how you view this person after, how you view these songs, how you view yourself. Like, to me, that's the kind of art that sticks with you for much longer than a, a day or two. Like, right now, you, you're speaking to artists right now. Like, all artists need to hear that. Like, if, if you can make that kind of impact on, on people, you know what I mean? Like, that's that's something they're going to remember you. They're going to they will yeah. in some way or fashion, whether that's just clicking on articles to see, read more about you and learn more about you or actually listen to your music. Like, if you make an impact, people are going to keep that curiosity. Like, what... That that Jay Z project, that four four four. I'm curious since you mentioned it. What if you could describe the impact it had on you, or and, and your impact on how you perceived him? Like what what was the change for you? You know, it's interesting when you are a child, you look at adults as people who have everything figured out. Yeah. And all growing up is is realizing you don't have it all figured out. And I yep. thought Jay Z as this superstar rapper, as this small business businessman, had his shit together. Mm. Right? You think he has his stuff together. And then you get the elevator scene. When you see it, you see it visually. <laughs> it doesn't have it all together. Like, <laughs> it, like oh, there is something wrong here. Right? Mm. This is this is something money can't stop. This is something that status can't stop. This is something like you're having a very human issue in the elevator with your sister-in-law and your wife. Yeah. And then you take that same kind of feeling and you unravel yourself. That's one thing I liked about 444. It unraveled Jay-Z, the man. He was no longer trying to be a persona. He wasn't trying to be this larger than life person. He wasn't, you know, that's my thing about Jay-Z. Jay-Z's always been larger than life, you know. He said he'd rather live enormous than dormant, right? And he did that. He did that. That was not a joke. He didn't just, that's just not a rap line. He was huge. Yeah. And then he unraveled himself. He brought himself down to a level that looked human. And I had to, I had to realize that, man, you could be almost 50 years old and still, like, figure life out. You can still figure out, like, man, I need to be a better husband. Man, I need to be a better uh, father. Man, I need to be a better son. Like, you can still hit these points in your life where, you can self-analyze yourself and realize your faults and realize how you can be better. To me, that's all that album is. It's like Jay-Z looking at himself, looking at how no one wins in the family feuds, but you only get that after feuding with your family. You don't wake up and just like, oh man, not like you have to go through that smile about his mother and how she came to the conclusion that, you know, not only am I going to be open about my sexuality, but like I want to be free. You know, I don't want to hide that from nobody. Yeah. Gloria Carter is older than all of us. Yeah. But she, like, the fact that she can still have that platform to do, like he gave her that platform to do that, yeah. and I like I can only imagine how free that made her feel. You know, like just this 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 idea that as we're getting older, we want to figure stuff out. Yes, but that means you have to always be aware of yourself. You have to be aware that all right, what does being better mean? You know, you have to look at yourself sometimes in the mirror and, and kill that ego. But you got to figure out what that ego is. That's why, like, it starting the album off killing Jay Z and not Sean Carter to me spoke so much to self development. Like, I don't want to hide behind a mask. I want to be as open and honest about who I am as a person. And hearing someone say that in in as in rap, where ego is such a big deal, like that's like armor. Ego's armor. To see him take that armor off, it's just like I don't I don't understand how anyone can listen to that album and not like self analyze themselves or or be aware that as I get older I need to do this. I need to kill my ego. I need to be aware of myself at all times because it does affect the people around you. You know, you don't want to be Jay Z in the elevator. That's not who you want to be. <laughs> yeah. Man, don't stink. <laughs> that's that's, that's, a, that's a bar for life right there. That's a measure. Like <laughs> you don't want to be in the <laughs> But no, I really think like, I know as, as much as no one wants their life to be shown like that, to me, it was just such a good visual representation that even, like, the the highest people love, the people we admire, the people we assume have these perfect lives, their yep. lives aren't perfect. They, they're just not. Oh, yeah. Like, I remember you that. Improve your life, and I feel like that's all, uh, all he's been doing since then is just improving his life. Yeah, I remember because very vividly, like, you would hear cheating rumors after that. And I was like, I mean, whether the cheating rumors are wrong or right, like, 
Something ain't right. <laughs> Something is wrong. <laughs> Sister, I'm looking at you like that. Like, Can nah. you imagine if he had to go through a divorce? Like, if we had to watch that unfold, yeah. I, I don't think I was ready for that yeah. kind of, like, yeah. realism. Like, no, that's too real. That's too real. But, like, also, I think he had to acknowledge that, man, maybe we're not as good as we could be. And now it's unfolding into the public. So, same thing with Beyonce. Like, watching her growth as a person, like, there's just no age you stop growing if you want to grow. And that's what I loved about the Lemonade 444 and Seat at the Table trifecta is that, to me, that's just about black growth. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can evolve, you can get better, you can uh, look at your past and heal your own traumas. Like, these are things that you have to do as you get older because, you know, they don't tell us this when we were really young. You know, you just think you're going to figure it out. But it takes a lot of self-realization to do these things. And that's what like I love about at least the music. You can see these grown people, these heroes of ours, do that. Do something that human. And you know, it makes you makes you realize you're not above that. You are not beneath that. Like you have to go through those same phases too. Just a true example in life. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, because it was that's just what take from rappers, man. Not the jewels, not the cars, like <laughs> the real life so, Some shit like that, man. Cause Jay Z's always been introspective i think that was what allowed him well, he was just being introspective about his hustle life more so than more his that other side of life which already contains a lot of ego and protection and privacy you know mm, right. but every once in a while i remember he'll like he'll and, and that's what made it so interesting because he wasn't talking about like streets in the way other people would talk about it but because it would be like more psychology driven the way he would mm, yeah but the first time I remember even him just dropping a more personal gem was like the one that the first one I noticed was um, in Lost Ones. And he said, like, my nephew died in the car I bought and, and something like, does that make it my fault? And, and like, I, I thought about it when I, I didn't even catch that the first few times I listened to it. But one day I just sat and thought about that, like that feeling. I was like, that's some real like human shit right there, you know, like you, you cause you know it's your fault, but he thinking this, you know what I mean? That's, that was, and that's when I really started to him. Sure. And, you know. Like wealth, man, if you have all this money, you want to yeah. give it back to your people, you want to give back to your community, but yeah. like it doesn't make you God, you yeah. know, it doesn't make sure you, protect, like you're not able to protect everything or everybody, but you got to think about him on a psychological level that, he has to sit and consider, like, damn, if I wasn't Jay Z, if I couldn't even buy him this car, would he still be here? Yeah, you know, stuff like that it will, will hit you and make yeah. you have to think. I gotta yeah. process that. Yeah. And then, yeah. I mean, it's hard. It's hard not to though. Like, when yeah. you make it doesn't have to be your fault, but um, uh, uh, something as small yeah. as a car accident will make you think about, like, damn, who get? I got this. I gave him that car. Like, yeah. I gave him that car. You know, even though you have no control over that, you want to take some type of responsibility because it's like damn without me this doesn't happen but you know you can't do that you know you can't look at life in that way you know there's there's powers at work that you can never consider you know you mm -hmm. just gotta kind of live it day to day otherwise that should have paralyzed you but um, yo you so finished <laughs> out <laughs> you can't do God. shit man. you sit in a damn corner but Facts. like so we had to like talk about well one last thing on them I think it was really interesting because I've never talked about it in a, in a video or anything, but I always talk about you can either mastermind things or you can use shit that's already happening and flip that and mastermind from there, like energy that's already out there. And I think they don't ever, they never would have been where they are now without the elevator scene becoming so public because they were super notoriously private, but they figured out a way to use that energy to work for them. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I think that's... I, I uh, not because you're my bad brother, but I know people want to think like, oh, everything's staged, everything is like, yeah. oh, they did this for marketing. But I don't think that's that's how things tend to work for people sometimes. I feel like sometimes you get hit by surprises and you don't know what to do with those surprises until you, you realize like, okay, maybe there's a sign here. Maybe we should be more public. Maybe part of the issue is that we want to be so private about our, our own personal things. So if we're going to be these people, we have to go outside. We have to live with this. Why not we figure out a way to open up for them to see us, right? And, and in doing so, you kind of open up for each other. Like, I feel like that's, like, so much self-healing and 
understanding that certain secrets are to be kept, but also that we're going to be public figures. There's there's something to the public that we want to give, so they realize too. Like, man, we're still people, and I know y'all coming out to see us in hordes, and I know every word and all of these like these are the things. But at the end of the day, we're still people, and sometimes it's the faults that help us remember that some of the people that we look up to can aren't perfect. They're just not perfect. For sure, man. And then it becomes the more more uh, inspiration versus idolatry, which is a good thing. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, uh, 100%. Like, so all this, like like I said, it kind of brings me back to some branding stuff. And I think it's the perfect timing when we talk about their privacy, your brand. Like you got one of the strongest writer brands out there. Because you have your own, you got a strong logo, right? And, you know, typically as people can see for this interview, like your face isn't out there. So uh, where did that come from? Because you talk, because you say, hey, like things aren't always masterminded. You, you mentioned to me that it wasn't like a mastermind for, for it to happen. Oh, uh, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing about it is, like just naturally as a person, I'm not like big on like taking pictures. It's just nothing, it's not something that I do. Like if I go out with the homies, we're not flicking it up, you know? Like I've always been like really big on living in the moment. And then I always felt like I don't want to impose upon anybody that I'm meeting as far as like rappers or entertainers or celebrities with like pictures. Like I was like, that was weird. So to me, and then and then going get the writer aspect of it, even though we live in such a visual age, my thing was to always represent myself in the words. Like I always wanted that to be as close to a portrait of what who I am than any camera could give for me. So it was just kind of like naturally, this is how I always been. It's just like I like I don't pick pictures up. Like that's just what I don't have an Instagram, but that's like a prevalent part of my life. And then it kind of became like, oh, he's just this mysterious person. No one knows who Yo is. I've gone like I've gone to shows and been introduced to people and watched them do double takes. I've gone and like I've been like it's <laughs> the experience of meeting people that know you but don't know you is fascinating. It is extremely fascinating. I've I walked in rooms and talked to people and then them come back and be like, I did not know you were you. You know, like stuff like that. But then, like, I also feel like people also like respected that. They respected that uh, he has this sense of privacy, and we're gonna keep that. So even if I do take pictures with other people, like I won't see them online, or sometimes I have seen them online, but I've had friends blur out my face and things, just like little silly stuff. But also just like respecting that. And in the process of all this, like I realized the power of you know deciding on what you want to share. Like mm-hmm. you can control what you want to share. You know, and when you decide to not share certain aspects to yourself, depending on what they are, those things can inherently turn into value. You know, like by not showing myself online, more people want to meet me, which I'd rather do. I'd rather meet people. Like, I'd rather you come to Atlanta and call me, and then I'll pull up on you, and we sit down and have a three hour conversation, and you follow me on Instagram and figure out, trying to figure out what I'm doing every day. I'd rather you come see me live and go live. You know, like, that's just how I am. As a person, yeah, and I noticed that like, okay, if this is what the brand's gonna be, it's just, it's not branding. It's just like how I live my life, and I and I think that there's nothing people can tell you what you should do, you know, like even if it makes you, if it makes you uncomfortable, you gotta ask yourself why is this making me uncomfortable? How can I make myself comfortable? Because I feel like that the, the closer you get to you online the closer you get to who you are online offline like once you once you have that synergy i feel like people feel like they, they get to know you better because mm-hmm. you're not you're not trying yeah. you're not posing at somebody you're yeah. simply being so like it'd be different if i was like people be like if i mf doomed it right if i had a mask and people never saw me and i was sitting like like Im- imposters like, but not like people know who I am. Like, that's not a thing. People have come to the city. I've actually, man, I didn't pick up people from the airport who didn't know what I looked like. <laughs> like that, like one of my homies, uh, Michael Penn II, he works, he writes to Follow Me Please. 
he'll tell you. Like, he had no idea who I was when I pulled up to get him. But, like, mm-hmm. he's come visiting me every year since, like, 2016. You know yeah. what I'm saying? He came slept on my couch. Never saw me. He's crazy by that. Like, don't do that. Don't be out here trusting everybody with no face, okay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that with everybody. But, you know, like I said, I feel like it's just it was just such a genuine – reflection of myself and anyone that knows me like you know like man y'all just want to take pictures like he, that's just not him and even more so now as i'm in places where people are taking pictures like i'm just like it's cool like, i don't have to do it but you know maybe i'll switch the brand up in like a year or two and do the dj academics Ooh, okay i'm sure that's gonna open shit up in a whole new way it's gonna be some uh, it could be it's funny because i always feel like Someone told me, it was like, oh, you know, if you showed your face more, like, you would have other, like, you would get more opportunities. Mm-hmm. But, like, I don't know. I feel like that's such a, the idea is because that's what other people do. You know, like, the concept of that thinking is, like, oh, other people do that, and this is what happens to them, so if you do it, it'll happen to you. No, I don't believe in that. I'm like, nah. I feel like if, if, if it's for me, it's for me, right? No matter what I'm doing, it's not, nothing's going to stop the show. So... If I, try, if I decide to change up the brand and things came my way, I thought it was going to come anyway because they were always for me versus, like, me trying to force things. Like, I'm not trying to force nothing. I'm not trying to force no relationships. I'm not trying to force no, like, no bags. Like, nah, like, everything has been, like, supernatural. And part of that is because I continue to do things that makes me comfortable. And I know what I need to be uncomfortable. I know when to put myself in places where, like, okay, yo, you need to do this because it's better for you. You know what I'm saying? At least you can say you've done it. And, you know, when those things when those things come back, like, I, I just got to recognize that. But, yeah, I, I, I'm telling you, man, I try to tell everybody, like, do what is it's just very true for you. I'm telling you, it's going to pay off. So, I, I think that's real good for artists to hear, especially, because they always struggle with, should I be on Instagram and be this booming star? Should I do some skits and all this stuff to get attention, all that kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, like, you, you can make it work how it wanted to work for you. you. Sometimes it might mean you have to go a slightly longer route. Sometimes there's just, a, or sometimes you not going that other way, there might be a shortcut that you just wouldn't have seen if you didn't. Like, it all works yeah. different ways, you know? Like, um, but so those, true. Um, they're so impatient, right? And, I, and I've experienced some of the stuff even with like my online, I don't mind as much like being seen now, but like, I don't know if you've ever seen, if someone, anyone goes back and see my first like I don't know, 16, 20 videos, they're like, no face, it's just a voice. And that's typically more me, but I, I'm also like this experimenting type guy, which is organic to me too. So I was experimenting with like videos, like two or three showing my face. And someone's like, oh man, yeah, you should do this more often. Should I have taken it or should I not? I don't know, but I, I did. Whatever I say, you know what? I'm, I'm going to keep doing the face, the face for now, and the videos are doing better. You know, that was just a marketing experiment guy for me, but it wasn't about, like, but if, if I had to go by my personality, most people know me in, like, real life. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, yo, man, you, you're you not, like, that much energy all the time. Like, I'm more pick, pick and choose. I'm a real laid back type dude. It just, so, but I, I'm constantly trying not to play myself at the same time. <laughs> with me being out there. <laughs> Yo, you know what I like about this? Is that you you tried something and it worked and then you made it comfortable for you. Yeah. Right? You kept yeah. doing it. But you it wasn't like you you come in these videos trying to be anybody else. You just yeah. changed that, okay, I'm gonna have my face, but and I I'm going to adjust myself in a way that I feel like this is gonna work for me. But it's still all based on you. You didn't say like, oh, so and so. Like you didn't pick a person and say, oh, I'm gonna do what he did. See, that doesn't <laughs> work. That, that doesn't work. Like sometimes it, it does. Like you have to adjust your brand in some ways. But you, like I said, like you have to figure out how you can maneuver yeah. in a way that still stays true to yourself, or in a way that makes you as comfortable with yourself as possible, even in an uncomfortable situation. Because that's, to me, I've seen it fail a hundred times when people decide, oh, so-and-so, it worked for them. So let me chase that. Like, nah, maybe you have to look at what your brand is, figure out where can I make adjustments, and see if it works for you. And that's it. Not everything's going to always work, but 
like I said, it's that self-awareness. You have a little bit of self-awareness and be able to recognize what needs to be adjusted. I think you always be able to have that that foresight when something's working and when something isn't working. For sure, man. I, I mean, self-awareness, I could tell that's a huge thing for you. It's a, it's a big thing for me, too. Uh, I know a lot of people follow yeah. Gary Vee and all his advice. And I'm like, the only one that actually matters is self-awareness <laughs> like that, that he talks about. Because some, the, so many things he says you wouldn't do if it wasn't for you. Like, he always talks about, um, like, everybody's not necessarily meant to be number one. In terms of the entrepreneur, you could be, he says, like, number 12 made more, more money than everybody else at Facebook than a, a lot of these other companies, entrepreneurs. So number 12 is like a billionaire or a hundred millionaire. And a lot of people think you got to be an entrepreneur for money. They think that's, but most millionaires actually in the, um, in the, in the country do get made that are, are actually working with somebody else. Something we don't talk about a lot, but I only say that because like, it's just if you, I, that's one thing I like about him. Even he talks about all this other stuff, the consistent undertone is like, if it works for you, like don't, don't play somebody else's game. Cause that's why I had to discover for myself. Like you play somebody else's game and you're losing even if you win in that, that game, you know what I'm saying? So I think social media, I mean, I think it's always been prevalent is that you watching somebody else and it, it might not be that you want what they have, but you might feel like you need to be like, oh, why am I not in Alexa? Subconscious, man. Hell like yeah. It makes you consider, but something that I'm trying to do more at is realize like, okay, what do you want? Like, what do you want? Take everything, take everyone else out of the equation. What do you want? Okay. Mm -hmm. How do you get there? Cool. You get there, and then you ask yourself again, what do you want? Because I think it begins there. It begins to figure out your wants and then chasing those wants. You know, knocking off these goals, but you got to take other people out the equation. You got to take your parents out the equation. You got to take your friends out the equation. You got to take anybody that can influence what you want that you might not. If you, if you can't consider why you want something, like you never thought, like, why do I want this? And if it's simply because, oh, I've seen someone so have one. Like, why do you want 100,000 followers? Why? For what? Why do you want to be a brand? For what? Is there something you want? Is there something that you want? Then, yes, go get that. Or even if you're a rapper, like, why do you want a record deal? If, if, if having a record deal does not make sense to your art, then why do you want one? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you want a record deal because you want to have hit records, cool, but you know, you've got to write certain kind of records. You have to put yourself in a certain kind of position that uh, is very uncomfortable for some people. For some people, that's where they want to be. I think Drake was a perfect example of someone who said, I want to be the biggest artist in the world and went and did that. Because that's who he wants to be. But like, you can't look at Drake like, man, I want to be Drake. Because you don't even know what Drake wanted when he decided to be Drake. Yeah. Like, it doesn't start with saying, like, oh, shit, bro. Like, I'm just going gonna, gonna to do what he's doing. Nah, that's never it. It never works like that. I feel like that never takes you where you want to want to end up going it'll take you somewhere but i don't know if that's where you want to be at yeah like you gotta you can follow people for baby steps just from just like to get yourself going get a template but you always have to be self-aware to be able to you know say no am i going the wrong direction because you know it's, at a certain age you don't have certain experiences to even understand what you want yeah. you, gotta, you gotta constantly reevaluate and i've had yeah. i've had a moment like that where I was like, holy shit, like everything that I was doing was taking me in the wrong direction. Like, I don't want none of this. Why am I doing this? Like, I had to have it before. So, but you, I get it. It's, it's, it's funny how life will show you that. Yeah, if everything is taking you to the wrong direction, like, maybe you're going the wrong way. Like, if there's a, if there's a bunch of, like, bad encounters, bad moves, bad, just if bad things continue to happen, you have to kind of stop being like, well, this is just bad luck. Like maybe I'm putting myself in a position where these things are occurring. Okay, well maybe let me go over there. Let me put myself over there and see what happens. But again, like they don't teach us self awareness. They don't teach us that we need to figure out what works for us, and not what works for everybody else. You know, I understand why it's so natural, but also like we that's something that I just want to pass on to people. It doesn't really matter what you want, but just make sure you want it and then figure out how you're going to get there your way. And you notice it. Like, I'm telling you, the world will always show you if you're doing the right, if you're going in the right direction. Because it's, it's always signs, bro. It's always signs. Yeah, for, for sure, man. I, so this entire, like, first portion of, of this conversation, 
I want like anybody who's going through branding, marketing, or just building something in general, like just really just life. Like you should probably listen to this thing like two or three times because the stuff that Yo is talking about is is just it's just necessary to figure out and you'll make shit way easier on your life, yourself in general, as opposed to just trying to follow and listen to every single thing that people talk about, including my channel. You're not, you don't need to do everything I talk about. You got to do the shit that works for you that I talk about on my channel. And, and that self-awareness piece is going to make life way easier. And, and yeah, get- I know I'm here to be a writer, but like, this is literally just like the stuff that I process before writing, after writing, like, well, not even which articles, man. Like the cool thing about DJ Booth is that they've always asked me, "What are you passionate about?" Like yeah. every assignment has began with passion. So yeah. I've never felt forced to write something for clicks or to do something I feel like was going to be successful or viral. I always got a chance to start with me, and if it worked, beautiful. If it didn't, well, you know. Sometimes you gotta realize, like, okay, maybe I could have framed that better, or maybe I could have uh, figured out a better way of taking that passion and making it something digestible. But it always begins in with something that I want, or they pitch me an idea and I frame it in something that I want. And like I said, like that's just a, a beauty of working for a publication that puts emphasis on um, great content without having to consider always like things being the biggest or being, you know, number one. Like, of course, we want to have that that sense of pride, but we get that from doing good work, you know. And the like, reason why okay. we the website like, is for good work. Man, and the only way to keep man. that up is just knowing what you're passionate about. I feel like I feel like the best work comes from people who understand what they're passionate about. Sometimes it's not just like a particular subject. Like, if you if you love battle rap, uh-huh. all right, you go into the battle rap space. If you love Southern rap, and you go, the best advice I've received from um, David Dennis, he's a writer from New Orleans who moved to Atlanta and he teaches at Morehouse. He freelances at a bunch of different places, but he told me, he was like, find your space, figure it out. Like, don't matter what the publication is, figure out your space. If your space is gonna be Southern rap, can always be the one that they need to come to for Sun and Rap. So that means anything that happens in the South, bro, they need to come to you. Rather it's uh, editors, rather it's people, that you create that space for yourself. If you, or, or you can create multiple spaces for yourself. But the best way of navigating all this noise is by knowing how to amplify your voice. And you can't be the loudest about everything, but you can be the most knowledgeable about some things. And those things you are most knowledgeable about Make sure you're the loudest about those. So when you are, like, you're able to get those pictures off. You're able to get those reads. People are looking to you. You're no longer trying to force people to watch you. They're, they're coming to you for that. And that's the thing. Like, I think DJ Booth Space is just passionate writing. So if people come here. Like, even if you read something about an artist you don't know, you know the way it's going to be written, the way it's going to be delivered. From DJ Booth is always going to be from a writer that's passionate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I think what's so important about that is is it allows you to be you and but it also it differentiates you at the same time. And so when you think about a personality, people are now going to want to know what Yo thinks about Yo's face. Like so I'm some some shit might happen. It might pop off and I'm like, dang I can't wait till Yo writes an article about this. You know? exactly. And when you offer something like that, people are gonna come to see what Yo thinks in the same way that I mean, no matter what, like the people are gonna come to see what Yo thinks, even if I got an opinion from somebody else. Right. Well, in the same way, I might talk about one friend about this project and this another friend about this project. It's like in the same way that someone might watch Skip Bayless on ESPN, Undisputed, yeah. Sharp, but then they still might watch Stephen A. Smith and Max Kellerman talk about the same stuff because yeah. they're talking about it from their unique perspective and their yeah, unique perspective, perspective and their voice. And you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and that's the thing I, I encourage many people to read as many writers as possible because we all don't have the same opinion, we all don't have the same writing style, but you can appreciate the way. This person over there says this. This person over there says this. It's like 
that's what I love about the space of writing, man. Like, there's so many people with so many opinions, and you can appreciate them all without being like, bro, I only read so and so. Like, nah, like, I don't, I don't want you to only read me because I know when you read me, you read my man over at Vulture, like Craig, or you read um, one of my homies over at Double XL, you read one of my homies over at Undefeated, and you get all these opinions. Then you get the chance to start shaping the way you think, the way you start, start to shape, like, the way you believe something's right. Like, okay, like, I understand where he was coming from, but I don't agree with that guy. And that, I'm telling you, it sharpens your own mind when you start to engage with writers, but also never stop thinking about how you feel. Never start uh, thinking about why a song made you feel away and why it made them feel away. You know, that we don't always have to agree, but I feel like we should always be able to articulate how we feel. I got you. It, may, it makes complete sense, man. Um, like, I mean, like I said, iron sharpens iron and getting those different yeah. opinions. And, and it's super dope because so many writers, they have great, like, precise thoughts or just deep thoughts on things. You notice all, all writers, for the most part, pretty much read a lot. Like, you read yeah. your ass off, I can tell, because yeah. you're always referencing something obscure. Well, sometimes it's not even obscure. I might know what it is, but you still, like, but... You're, you're constantly making those connections because you read that shit somewhere at some point in time. And that just yeah. adds more to your body of work. Man, it's probably the best advice my first editor Nathan gave me. He told me, he said, a good writer is a good reader. Mm. And when I first heard that, I didn't really know what that meant. But the thing about it is you're absorbing all these words. You're absorbing all these ways to put words down. You're absorbing... Um, but you feel like it's good writing when it's bad writing and then how you try to channel that through yourself. Like you start to be like uh, a lightning rod and you want to have as much lightning coming your way and hitting you as possible because you want to be electrified. Like when, I, when I'm not reading, bro, I feel so sluggish because it's just like I'm missing something like a nutrient that mm. kind of helps me get my day started. You know, I'm trying to read like a book when I wake up. I'm trying to read a book when I go to sleep. So that way, I start my day with the book, end my day with the book, and I'm writing in between that. Because it's just, book? like I said, no, 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 hell no, nah, man, no. I know if you want to like, like, <laughs> But, like, I'll have, like, two different books. Like, that way, okay. I feel like because I don't have, I only have an hour that getting through a book, it takes to be longer. And I'm, I have so many interests. I'm so interested in so many things that, like, okay, I try to stop, I try to stop things at two books. So that way... If I can get the one book, then I'll start another one. I'll get the other one, I'll start another one. But yeah, like I feel like the same thing with music. The more music you absorb, the more flows you hear, the more production styles you hear, the more you absorb that allows you to have a, a different way of approaching your own stuff and finding your own style. Because I think every writer, or in every rapper, you begin by imitating somebody. You only imitate because you spend so much time listening. And then you take that imitation, you start to shape how you want to present yourself. But I think it's always good to stay updated and always kind of know what else is out there because you don't have to necessarily copy it, but you are always like inspired. Like, oh man, like, he can he can rap like that. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Or oh, man, maybe you don't feel any inspiration. So it just makes you want to put that out there. Like, man, now I want to make sure I inspire that next kid to want to be on his A game because I don't see nothing out there. Like it works that way, man. We're putting so much into the world and someone's grabbing it. That's why I, I make these obscure influence like references because I want you to take that. I want you to go and read that because I know you're going to pull something else out. Yeah. You're going to pass that on to somebody else. Like, we're just like, people have been making shit forever. You know, there you go into a record shop, there's a million records. Not all of them are popular. Not all those guys have the, the, the biggest homes or, or even are rich when they past then they left some art here that maybe you can hear that and you can sample it and now it's a hit record now it's a big deal that's mm -hmm. it man we're all just absorbing and repurposing what we have you know all these inspirations to create something that's that's it man you can take these small pieces the, the, one of my favorite examples of um like that kind of like just taking these small pieces for sampling and things like that is like I, I i listen to so much music because of my dad like just he, like one of those true listen to everything type dudes grow up listening to a lot of shit that i would hate listening to growing up but uh one day i was listening to his one of his tracks and there's this track by mandrill an old group and that's what shawty low sampled for the 
doom. Uh, it's literally like, you know, them old songs are like seven minutes long. It's literally like four seconds out of that song. They don't even do it more. The, the rest of the song, you wouldn't even think that. Uh, it's, it's, it's wild. It's like, yo, someone was listening to this. Like, it's kind of classical music. It's kind of it's African music. It's like, and someone just took this one part and said, I'm going to loop this and make a whole, like, make a hit out of it. And that kind of stuff is interesting to me. I, I know producers get in that bag a lot because they're constantly, like, they're constantly hearing music differently in the same way you're reading books. I always think that's super dope. But artists, shit, they, you have to really bring in inspirations and repeat together puzzles. It's really, you don't have to invent everything, but if you can innovate and reconnect things differently, that's pretty much the game right there. Yeah, honestly. And that's why I always loved about sampling is because it allows you to pass along history. Like, yep. That allows us to, like, like, you can take an album of samples and it's like a history book. You know, you're flipping through these songs and there's just these little pieces of history that exist in the present now that you can go back and you can hear that now and be like, oh my God. Like, yeah. I love when I go out and hear a sample because, like, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought it was a whole different song. Yeah. Like you, you'll be thrown off. You'll be so confused because you'll hear a part in the song, and you, and you think you know that rap's coming. That that drum's about to drop, and it's not. It's like a a, a trumpet solo now. It's a whole <laughs> different record. Yeah. But now you're just like, wow. Now, like if you sample something, you really are able to have a relationship between two different songs, from two different eras, two different time frames, two different like just two different periods. I think the yeah. more we consider that. Like in the grand scheme of things, not just with like production, but everything, how we want to sample and we want to take and we want to borrow, we want to allow as much that we have absorbed in this world. Like, even when you, know, you can talk to your pops, he can give you a quote, and now you say that in the video, the song takes that, and they're like, Oh man, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that list. And like, as much as we can pass down and pass along in the small ways, I feel like has. Effect and it, it can it create something in somebody. You know, you never know what something's gonna come. Hey, that's for sure, man. I, I, I know. I just like an artist dropping a song. I'll I'll drop a video that I might not even like, and people go, "This your best video ever." <laughs> and then I don't even know how to feel about it. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> Somebody's gonna love something, man. It's, that's what I find so fascinating about yeah. picking out anything in the world is you can feel one way about it. And you just never know what that's going to do for somebody else. Yep. You know, I, I remember a bunch of just pieces that happened to be really popular that I might have not felt that well about when I were writing it or when it was published. Or even if it didn't get the most clicks and views, you know, that one person will hit you up and be like, bro, I read this and it changed my day or it inspired me to write this or, you know what I'm saying, it motivated me to, to listen to that artist. You know, sometimes that's like... I know social media is so big in numbers and analytics and everything, but all you need is one listener to to really change one viewer or one reader to potentially start that chain reaction. You know, that one person can take you somewhere. You have no clue that's going to happen just because, you know, they know somebody and they share with them, they share with somebody. The next thing you know, you at the interesting office because three people shared a song. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to take four million views. That's wonderful, right? You're getting paid for it, but a lot of times we be looking at these numbers and you're looking like, damn, no one's listening. And the thing that you want, like you want to get to that next level, sometimes you can get there just because two or three people are paying attention. That's one hundred percent. That's one hundred percent. Like yeah, the right person who someone might have a platform, they might decide to a dude told me the other day he has yeah. um, some random Big meme page decided to use him in some montage, and like he had no relation to him, they somehow came across it. And then that even other meme pages took that meme, and like it just started spiraling for him. And he had nothing to do with the situation, like that's all you need. And you don't, and you don't get that without putting it out, like presenting it. You know, I'm 100% believe you want to get everything as fine as soon as possible. And, to make sure that you feel as good about the content you're making before it's out in the world. But there's going to be some things that you'll never be able to get them perfect, but they'll be perfect for somebody. You know, mm -hmm. someone else is going to see that perfection. And them seeing that perfection, you just never know what that can do, not just for them, but even for you in the same token. It can take you somewhere you never imagined just by hitting it out, just by having it in the world. 
you know, even the songs you put out don't have no views for the first year. And next thing you know, somebody has spot up out there on the playlist. Yeah. And now you now you up. You up up. And you can see that coming because you were you were so worried about that first day, that first week. That's why it's so crazy you talk about first week sales, then we should talk about end of year sales. Like how many albums you sell the year? Yeah. Dude, that what matters. Like who can't afford people miss things every day. So the fact that we tend to focus so much on first week sales is silly. When it's just like how how was your year? You put out an album, that's a Incredible. So how did you able to work that thing throughout the entire year instead of trying to make sure you got that number one for what, seven days? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's cool. But like, you want to be number one at the end of the year? You want to turn the calendar and be number one? Because you can't. Like, you can get those numbers up every week. And by the end of the year, you have accumulated more sales than everybody else. If you work something like that. But man, we'd be so focused on the momentary. We want to see there's like a bigger picture. Yeah, it's, it's weird. It's like trying to go for the trophy as opposed to going for the win. Facts. Like what? Twist, twist away like the what? <laughs> People want to go to the, the championship but not play regular season. Yeah. Like you got to play the regular season. You got to go to the playoffs. You got to get, like, you got to go through all of that. You just don't go to the ship. You yeah. just don't go to the war ceremony. Yeah. Like, no, nah, it's a whole process of getting there, which to me, You'll understand the reward of that on the way. But if you just want to jump there and get the trophy, man, you don't even fathom what you missed out on. And that's usually the best part. Yeah. Well, yeah, because you can't even appreciate it the same. And it's funny you talk about those, like, ah. man. Because when you think about instant hit, I mean, of course, like, there's been a lot of records that still keep, keep moving. But there's been so many things that have been impactful that, like, in hindsight, you find, like, finding out they didn't even do what you would have thought they did when they came out. Like, I was watching um, – I don't know if you saw Robert Townsend's Breakfast Club interview, but he talked about Five Heartbeats was a flop when it came out. And that's like a cult classic in, like, in black community. So many people know that movie. It comes on BET all the time. But when it came out, it was a complete flop. Was like, uh, no money, like, nothing like that. But then just accumulated over time, it, it made the money like I think he put in like 300k or 100k whatever and now it made like it made like 10 mil over time something like that but that, he's not that long game and it changes it changes I was I got a piece coming out tomorrow I wrote about Outkast get up get out and okay. I didn't realize it was a radio single it was like the third single uh Southern Playlist and it's like wow that was a single there's no way that did well that's not because it, it, it doesn't translate to yeah. like, yeah. That's not his ball, you know. That's not mm -hmm. Rosa Parks. This is it's like it's a really dope record, but that's not going to work for radio. So let's say they look at that song and be like, "Dang, but like it didn't do well on radio. It didn't chart." But the cultural relevance of that, get out, get up, get something like that, transcends the the radio. That transcends the time period. Like mm -hmm. that's a that's not just a staple. That's a phrase people say to themselves to get up in the morning. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes you yeah. can't. Sometimes you can hit the jackpot and hit something commercial, and it's huge and it's big, it's wonderful. You get all the trophies, but sometimes you gotta appreciate when you, you're you're generational. You know, when you transcend that pocket of time and you live on in something that's far longer and maybe not like economically as rewarding in the moment, but like. Have somebody talk about something you did for 20 years, bro. Like, that means that's going to live on for a long time. And that's mm -hmm. not an easy thing to do. But when you get it right, it's, an, it's an incredible. You know, like, you, you take perspective and consideration a lot. Um, you seem to be very introspective and you seem to be very observant. You, made, you had a quote in – I actually just came across it today because I didn't know that you wrote another article about your Dreamville session. And uh -huh. – I, the the quote I'm gonna start with here, but then we can dig into that. And you were just talking about the fact that matter of fact that I write it down somewhere. It, it don't. Let me see. You know what? This is the quote. You said reading all the commentary on social media allowed me to see how the outside perspective was formed based on the little information showed from within. It's something I've certainly done in the past. Building a structure with the bricks that were given while never allow access to the entire blueprint. There was there was reality, and then there was this warped version. 
what was thought to be. And then you talk about, you know, there was a bigger picture though, like the, there, a picture may be worth a thousand words, but how many of those words are true, right? Cause and, and you were just, uh, like you were speaking on how this session completely changed your perspective, right? And I want to hear how and why that changed your perspective. Um, there's a couple of things. I mean, the thing is, and as a journalist, you get invited to a lot of things. But yeah. A lot of things are public. And then you get invited to things that are private, you know, mm-hmm. non disclosures, you can't talk about it. They're not seen by the outside. Mm-hmm. And I've experienced both of those things, but I've never experienced going somewhere and people knew I was there and they did not have all the information. They didn't know what was going on. So mm-hmm. I got a chance to watch as That's certain right. commentary was being formed based on what was happening inside that just wasn't true. I think one of the major conversations was about how there were like no women in media was invited. I mean, that's true, but that's because no one in media was invited. Like I was invited through being in Atlanta and kind of knowing a bunch of people who were active during the session. So I was able to get an invitation, but they invited me as Yo, not necessarily like Yo from DJ Boo. And then same thing kind of went with Jinx, who is on every, not every struggle, but on Stay of the Culture with Joe Bunny. Yeah. Jinx was able to get invited as well through knowing people and also just being in Atlanta. He was here for a time and he left and came back. So we weren't necessarily members of media, but we were there. So to kind of see this conversation being formed about members of media being present and women not being included, but again, there was no media. There were plenty of women there. There's plenty of people there. But I watched as this conversation was unfolding. And then I later heard that people had heard rumors or they saw tweets that insinuated that other men were there that weren't there. They were nowhere on the presence. Like they weren't at all. Mm-hmm. And it made me realize I was like, wow, watching that unfold based on information that wasn't clearly true, but seeing the discussion, and then it's a necessary discussion. We should always have women wherever men are like the counterpart should always be present it should be anywhere men can go as media that women shouldn't be able to go that's 100 percent true but to kind of see that conversation warped around something that wasn't true i was like whoa, whoa, whoa. i was like how many times have i done this how many times have i taken something based on the little information i had and try and wrap some truth around it you know try and insinuate things without having the full scope, without seeing the blueprint. I'm trying to build a house, but how can you build something with no foundation? How can you build something without knowing what the structure is? But I saw what happened and that was one indication. And then I, I'm just, I saw like, I won't say what it was, but a particular picture that came out and I got chances to see people talk about like, oh, this song probably sounds like this, or this song probably sounds like that. And I was like, man, they were just sitting there talking. Uh, not a single song was made. It wasn't even a beat playing, but they were just talking. A picture comes out, but now we're talking about what the song is like. Now we're talking about who produced it. Like we're, we're allowing our imaginations to run wild without knowing the context of the picture. That could have just been somebody coming in saying, I hate your guts. And someone captured it all right on time. But mm-hmm. obviously, like, that nuance isn't there. But again, I've done it too. I've seen things and I've gotten excited without even considering, like, what do I know about this? Before I even begin to get myself excited, not just tweeting about it, but like, before I even get riled up about something, like, what do I know about this? Who can I contact to get this information? Who do I need to talk to? If I care enough to have thoughts on this, let me get as close to the truth about this before I start insinuating. Like someone asked me the other day, J. Cole's gonna drop a song at 9 p.m. called Middle Child. And someone was like, What do you think the song means? Like, I don't know. It's just it's just a song title. Like, we don't have anything. But that's the thing, like, people get excited. People start thinking, and I was like, I don't wanna do that anymore. Like, I just wanna know what it is. Yeah. Just show me what it is, right? And then I take it for what it is. If I don't have all the information, I'm not formulating anything. I'm not even gonna consider what could be or what isn't until I get the full, because I'm not even going to get myself riled up. I'm not going to start arguing with people on Twitter about something that's not real. 
Wait like, why am I even having these conversations with y'all? Why, why are we going back and debating if we both don't have the full scope of the information? But yeah, that was just my thing. I got a chance to see so much of that. I got a chance to see so much of how certain people, how they move around and how they're cool and how maybe my initial thoughts on them was based on something that wasn't completely true, you know, like or maybe based on information that wasn't able to articulate the fullness of this person. I was like, man, we, we insinuate so many things about people. You know, we make up how a person is in their fullness based on little information. Someone can tweet you a certain way and you can be like, that person's an asshole. Like, he could not he could have been having a horrible day and you asked a stupid question. He yeah. had a dumb reaction. But like, people, how people are, we tend, like, I think we just try and create identities for people based on the information we have versus all it is. take them for who they are. Like, you show me who you are and that's all, that's all I can treat you. But like, I cannot add or subtract from that. You know what I'm saying? My experience with you is my experience with you. And I'm just, I'm just not projecting anymore. Like, I don't want to do that. I'm too conscious of that now to do that. And that's kind of what the piece was, man. I really wanted that article to be like, man, we, we sometimes get so excited about things without really considering how little we know. And if we can't have the full information, then maybe you should not get so wild up about discussions around like we can have certain discussions but just make sure those things are based on something with some legs something with some weight something with some truth to it and not what we think something is that's like that was like what i wanted for myself i wrote that piece as much for me as for them because i'm like yo you can't be out here doing this now because you've seen it like you do this now like it's you're really out here doing something that you know is inaccurate and that's i'm not trying to look like that Hey, see, that, that goes back to just that journalistic integrity, though. That keeps, that keeps the value in your shit in the long term, all right? Yeah. That's that small little wall. I was gonna, I was thinking about that when I read the article. I was like, hmm, so I wonder now, are there going to be, like, you naturally answer. I was like, now are there going to be some moments where you typically would have written something before, and now you just have this extra mm-hmm. little that might hold back? Or, or, or you change how you write it. Like you said, I'm not going to say it like this. Right, like I like it, it happens to me sometimes where I'll it's like, you know what? I'm gonna say that I'm gonna deliver the information, but I'm gonna say it like this instead because of the knowledge I might have of a situation. It it depends on what it is, man. One okay. thing that I got, I, I know I did the first piece, and like the second day I was there, I was trying to think about if I showed up here every day for ten days, right? And every day I wrote about these people that's happening in here. How many days until they start acting differently around me? Mm. You know, how many days do you not say something because she's like, damn, is that gonna end up in the article? Or how many days you do say something expecting me to quote you? Like how long until you start reacting to me being here rather than living around me? Mm. That was one thing I thought about just like as a journalist, as someone that's like taking uh, what's happening somewhere and writing it out for people that's not there. Like those details, I'm like, as cool as this is, of course there's gonna be some things off the record, but like I can watch something happen and I might think like, oh, that's great. I'm gonna go write that. And then somebody was like, hey bro, like, I really didn't want no one to know that I fell and busted my head when I was walking up the stairs that day. Like, you know, like I, just, I was trying to figure out like how do you get between detailing what's happening from your perspective, but also respecting people as people. Because I, I saw some things that I was just like, oh, man, like, it's not that it was bad things, but there's some information where it's just like, oh, you might not have known that about that person. Should I be the one to tell that? Mm. You know, that's why, like, mm. it made me realize even how I'm interviewing artists, I want to come into everything knowing the kind of information I want and then hoping you take me there, but not taking anything that's not there already. Like, if it's not there, it's just not there. Like, it's not for me to say something. That's why I understand about off the record. Like, things be happening, and you might not be able to even tell the whole thing because someone's like, hey, I don't want this information to come out in this way. And I think that's just fair to people. You just can't be out here, or at least I don't want to be. Like, I don't want to be that person who's known for pulling up on places and you taking information. Not that it's not supposed to be out, but, like, respect the fact that people decide how they want certain stuff presented. Like that's all I can. All I can respect. 
Dreamville had a hundred cameras everywhere. Like there's going to be like things that's going to come out visually from the um, from the session. So I knew like I didn't need to tell everything. They they deserve the opportunity to present certain information the way they want to, you know. So it's to me just always being like respectful of people as a journalist, but also as a person. I don't I don't need the clicks that bad. I can definitely respect that, man, because you know we're definitely in an era where people find value in and pride in, in trying to leak information or be the ones who talk about it first, whether it's their story to tell or not. So that's interesting to hear. It's dope to hear. I'll tell you, I, I really just want what's for me, man. I really just, all I want is what's for me. I don't want to like get what's for me through any methods that isn't necessary. And that's the thing, like the reason why you do, like the reason why I can go into a place like that is because like the respect, they respect my work as much as I respect their work. Yes. So, you know, that's why I asked Eve, the first Coles manager, Eve, I was like, hey, can I write about this? It was like, but we had already had a 20 minute conversation about just life, man. It's just like, I just had a niece, I'm telling them about that. We were just talking about like the sessions and all that stuff. Before I left him, I was like, hey, can I, um, can I write about this? And he thought about it and he was like, yeah, you good. Just like, he told me not to spoil any of the songs. But I was like, ah, okay, we'll see what happens. And then the next thing I know, he pulled me into the chiller room. It's like, you got to hear this. So, you know, it's like, you just want people to be respectful of you as you are of them because I want to be here as long as I can. And I know a lot of these people can be around as long as they can. And I want our report to be fair. You know, you don't always got to agree with my opinion. But I always want to treat you fair. And I treat you on fair, I want to like acknowledge that, like, yeah, bro, I was wrong, I was on the line. Because I always want you to engage with who you fairness. That's all I can ask. Like, you don't gotta agree with me. I don't always have to be on your side of history, but we are always gonna be on the fair side of history. Like that's it. If I can leave this game with everyone saying you're treating me fair, I done had a good career. Yeah, especially in music. <laughs> yeah, facts. <laughs> big, big facts, bro. Yeah, that's not the story. Okay. No, yeah, that's a lot. Well, tell me this, man. How do you write about, like, how do you choose artists that you write about? Do you ever, how often do you try to put new artists on or break new artists? Or do you guys get delivered a lot of topics? How does that work? It depends. Um, we're always listening to music, but first and foremost, like, we're always, we have, like, a slack with music. Like, you know, people drop slides, uh, drop SoundCloud links and Spotify links and we're listening to it. My friends are recommending music. I have uh, a lot of people that I come to, like, hey, what are you listening to? But really when it comes to writing about the artist, I want to know what people's stories are. Like, what is your story, right? Like, you can have the hottest song on SoundCloud. You can have 10 million plays, but like, that's all I'm writing. Like, oh, this is a really good song. Like, nah, if you, if you want people to know you, if you want people to engage with you and engage with your art in a way that makes them fans, I think nine times out of ten, unless you got something else going for you, you want people like blogs to tell your story and, and help translate that to people. The more you can able to translate your story and bring people to your music, I think that benefits you in the long run. Versus just trying to get like a post or just trying to get like a quick write up. And that doesn't really do anything for you. Like I'm telling you, it doesn't do nothing. But what helps in the long run is people engaging with you in a way that's like, this is who I am. And this is why you should want to tell my story. Like, that's my thing. Like, okay, who has a story that's not only worth telling, but also makes me feel like I. I want. I would want to. I would want to read about this guy. You know, mm -hmm. that's that's always a big thing too. Like I'm always thinking about how I was when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, and just constantly on the internet. And I know all my favorite artists are people that I knew their story. I knew J Cole's story. I knew Wale's story. I knew Charles Hamilton's story. I knew all their story, and that helped me connect with them as a long term fan. Versus, oh, this is just a hot song. I'm like I don't need a hot song, man. I need like a hot artist. I need someone that. I believe it. I need someone that makes me feel like, man, I want to see you go far. I don't get that without understanding who you are beyond that high song. Dope. Dope. I think, I mean, that's that's a lesson for all artists. I can't, I don't think they can hear that enough because we focus so much on being one-dimensional with so many things. I heard another. Uh, 
Yeah. You gotta, I feel like you gotta be able to give people something to connect to. Something. You know? Yeah. It, it can be what, what separates you, man. You can give 10 people the same beat, they use the same flow. And there's gonna be one guy that's gonna say something that's gonna get your interest. Like, huh? Oh, man, he was homeless. Okay, well, what happened? Yeah. Where, 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 what, what went wrong? Or what occurred that put you in that position? And even if someone has never been homeless, your story of what happened and how your mom got sick and you didn't have any money and you had to live on the streets for a while, but you were super passionate about music, so you were still able to record and you were able to take the music you were recording and, you know what I'm saying, get it on SoundCloud and get a couple plays, like stuff like that. That's all it takes is just allowing people uh, inside. And now I can walk away, not only know a song, but like now I know who that person is. And I know the story, so when I see your name again, I'm like, bro, I want to see you do well. Like, yeah. dang, bro, like, oh, that's the same guy that, ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, that's the same woman that, ooh, 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 ooh. like, I know that now. Like, I recognize that it's more than just being like, well, I can't, do I remember you? Who, who, what, who were you again? Who are you again? Like, nah, just tell the story. Give me a story to tell. Okay. Got you, got you. And that's important because I, the other writer I've heard, I, I talked to another writer recently by the name of Armand, Armand Sadler. He said something very similar. So, like, if you were listening to these interviews or these conversations, there's a concept for an artist. And they were, this many people are saying it who actually do it. <laughs> it, it, it there has to be some truth to it. So don't, don't just be lazy. There's some truth to it. I mean, I take it. I think it's, it's hard for anybody to take their songs and become, you know, these superstar artists. But all, I think, for everyone that I've ever, like, watched and grew and really enjoyed, it was something about them that was always deeper than the music. And how I got the information was always the blogs. I always got the information. I, I don't know how I would know about half the artists I know about, not just, like, their music, but them personally, without constantly reading interviews, without having the opportunity to read these interviews and, knowing where to find them like you know instagram is cool and having them see your tweets is cool and social media connects you but i feel like you got to sit down with somebody that can articulate your story and translate that for an audience because that's how you build that up if you really 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 want to build an audience i think got you got you um at least being built on your on you as a person not just you know that feature you got from 21 Savage. <laughs> that was just, just, <clears throat> just to kind of close things out, man, what are some important things that you've learned since you've become a writer in terms of what, what makes a writer valuable? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think probably like one of the most valuable things a writer can highlight, one of the most valuable tools is perspective is can you take something somewhere else that no one else can take it? You know, can you take an idea, can you take a song, can you take an artist, can you place it in a way that no one else can do it? And the thing is, we all got the same amount of words. We have the same amount, the same alphabet exists for all of us, right? That is, that's not gonna change. But how we look at things and then how we articulate the way we view those things can be what separates us from everybody else. You can literally separate yourself from the pack by just looking at things differently. You know, I remember um, one of my, I think one article that really made my editor think, like, okay, I like the way you think was I juxtaposed Kanye's spaceship from Fonte's Good Fight. And there were two different perspectives about like, Kanye's like, no, wait for your spaceship. I'm trying to get out of here. And Fonte's like, nah, man, you gotta work. Like, if you want this, then sometimes you got to have a job. Sometimes you got to do this. And I was looking at these two things, and I just inserted myself the understanding that, like, as much as I want to be Kanye, I got to acknowledge that I might end up being Fonte. You know, my spaceship might not come. I might have to get this job. But, you know, it's just fighting a good fight. It's not nothing wrong with that. You know, not everything happens because your dream is supposed to come true. Maybe your dream comes true in other ways. But... And I was able to articulate that in a way where, you know, he's he's never read that 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 juxtaposition of those two songs before, and 
that's my thing too. I'm, I'm always trying to connect things that might not necessarily be something that I've seen connected before. You know, that's why I read a lot, man. I try and connect things that might be literature, it might be um, it from like the 1970s, but incorporated with something that released last week, you know, and being able to frame these things in a way where it makes you not only reconsider how you saw it, but give you new perspective on things. You know, like I'm always like, I just always got my eyes open to see something in a very brand new way. And I think that helps writers a lot because the same way there's all this music out, there's all these opinions, there's all these think pieces. And the more you're able to set yourself away from the pack by thinking differently and positioning that writing differently, I think the more you're able to have people want that from you, you know, so they're coming to you from that. They want a different way of looking at things, and you can be that person. Got you. I think, man, there's so much in that statement that you just made because, uh, for one, as a writer or artist, any type of creative, if you're consuming the same information as everybody else, then it's hard to differentiate. How are you gonna yeah. come up with a lot of different stuff? So like you, like you, you, all right, you love this artist, you're trying to be in this lane, but you can't listen to that artist all the time. You gotta listen to some different artists. Like, or, and then you talk about being different. We're in this weird time where it's cool, learn and ever to be different, but there's, yeah. this, there's this, this vision of what different looks like, which makes everybody to be the same at the same time. Yeah. This is like weird. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta get away from those concepts. Yeah. But like chasing what something looks like rather than being what it is. Like exactly. just be what it is. Exactly. Like, you don't necessarily have to try and position yourself to be seen as this. Like, nah, if you just do it. Doesn't matter. I always tell my friends, like, it's like, oh, how do you, you know, what, how would you start writing? By writing. You want to be an A&R? Do the job. You want to be a manager? Do the job. Start with the job before you get the title. And I'm telling you, they'll call you by that title. Like, oh, man, so-and-so pissed this producer and this person together. They run this play. They ran that play. They are A&R. Like, you don't even have to give you, like, they'll give you the title. The same thing. It's like, they'll call you different before you have to feel like, am I different? Like, now nah, you just figure out a way that you see things. That's why, like, I started the year off, like, deleting Twitter because I didn't want to absorb as many thoughts. Like, I was like, okay, if I'm going to absorb thoughts, it'll be why I'm at the desktop. And if yeah. I'm at the desktop, I'm probably working, right? So I'm not looking at this as much. But what I'm going to replace that with is I'm going to replace that with articles. I'm going to replace that with books. I'm going to replace that with movies. I'm going to replace that with stuff that I want to absorb. Now I'm absorbing the information for me and not necessarily like the information I'm given. Yep. And now based on what I have, I can start taking things and like piecing it out the, out the way I think about it. You know what I'm saying? I'm only focusing on what I want to, to interact with and in the ways that I take that information and dissect it. And that way, to me, I hope it helps me get to original thoughts. I get closer to something that how I feel about things, and how I want to write about things, versus being so closely tied to what's viral, being so closely tied to what everyone else is talking about, and feeling like I might need to speak on this. Like, I just kind of, not to think that you have to get so far away from everybody, because of course, being current and being up to date is important, but you don't want to be too, too in the mix where everything is based on what someone else is talking about. Mm. Like, what do you want to talk about? What do you want the conversation to be? Like, you can kind of like engage and change that, but you, it starts with you figuring out like, how is this unique to me? Versus like, man, let me just insert what everyone, insert my thoughts on everything else everyone's already talking about. Mm. Impact. That's that was long Dope. Hey. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. I think there's going to be a lot of value in so many of the things you say because it's not all direct advice. It's a way of thinking, which is what I try to push so many times in my channel. Yeah. And I, I try to share that from other people as much as possible because I don't know, I'm, I'm weird about giving direct advice if I don't have to. <laughs> the weirdest thing, I think I used to be a little bit more keen on it. I used to want to be like, oh, let me give advice, let me get advice. And then I started realizing that, that everyone has your experiences. Yes. So like, 
what worked for you might not work for them at all because, you know what I'm saying, like they're interacting with whatever they got going on uniquely. Like you're not in their shoes. So a lot of my ways of thinking now is coming from my personal experiences mm-hmm. and then how I'm trying to place myself and hopefully like it works out. Like the thing is, like I said, when you're self-aware and you're constantly fine tuning, you're picking up things, you're dropping things off, you're constantly changing. But the what stays the same is that you're at least engaging with how things are changing versus mm-hmm. and accepting that this is how things are. I don't think I ever want to accept that this is how things are. Mm-hmm. Dope, dope. Way well, hey, I appreciate that, man. Hey, you guys follow at what? Well, it's not Yo Phillips on. Um, no, 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 no. It's like YOH31. I want the Yo, man, but the kid won't give it to me. Where, where, I just want to straight Yo, but some, some kid picked that up and was like, now nah, he had DM me. He had DM me like a couple months ago and was like, how much you want for it? No, you don't make me pay for that. It's like, he's trying to swindle me, man. I was like, okay. Hey, man, get a lot of people to, to report his account, man. Just get a... <laughs> Let's see that. Then I'm a bully. Like, I was like, no, he got me. I got to sometimes accept the fact he got me. He caught me slipping. He got it first. It's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have... <laughs> He'll you it one day, and I'll be, I'll be there. Hey, but yeah, no, it's uh, YOH31 at Twitter, and this, uh, at DJ Booth on Twitter. You can definitely follow them. Keep up to date with my, uh, with my articles. And, yeah, man, thanks for having me. It was cool to talk about this stuff because I feel like the more we engage and have these conversations, then hopefully it helps somebody somewhere. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, you guys definitely got to follow this dude. If you haven't know, didn't know who he was before this, I'm sure you can see that it's worth checking him out now. I'll put all the social media stuff up there, you know, blah, blah, blah. It'll be there. Other than that, if you like this video, go ahead and hit that like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button.